Ramda, good afternoon. Um, that was very powerful stuff. Fantastic. Uh, I was minded about the fantastic charisma we've actually heard from um, uh, Mohammed talking about charisma. And that last talk was tremendous. Uh, and uh, I started life as a chemist. And uh, after two years, uh, I discovered that these were probably the most uncharismatic people that I was working for. And I said, uh, I need to maybe join a profession where people are more charismatic. So I then became an engineer. Um, it wasn't a mistake, I mean, I learned a lot, but there wasn't much in the way of charisma. Uh, but so I, I discovered I'd actually made the wrong mistake in terms of uh, downgrading myself in the charisma stakes. So then I got approached by an accounting firm. <laughs> and need I say more? Um, I'm, I live just up the road uh, in a place called the Rosa Gilwen, which was, which was a nice, gentle cycle ride down here this morning. It's going to be slightly tougher going back up. Um, um, my talk is entitled Reason to be Cheerful, and we are incredibly cheerful uh, at Rosa Gilwen, particularly this last week, because we've had a lovely a week of sunshine. Um, but we're also very cheerful because um, I think we've got to a point where we can put our hands on our hearts and say we've actually got a sustainable future uh, for Rosa Gilwin. And, and much of what I'm going to be saying for 20 minutes is about why I think, in terms of sustainability uh, for the future of Rosa Gilwin, we seem to be in a good place. So exceedingly good uh, reasons to be cheerful. Um, a bit about the house. Uh, um, is, uh, it was built in Victorian times, uh, 1890 uh, approximately. Uh, it was burnt in a fire, very severely damaged uh, in 1988. Uh, um, and my wife and I moved in in 1994 when it looked very sorry for itself. There were just two, three rooms that were habitable. Um, uh, the gardens uh, were uh, also in a pretty bad state, uh, the wall garden, uh, the arboretum. And thanks to uh, a tremendous amount of hard work by some fantastic people who have actually worked there over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, uh, by the turn of this century, the house uh, uh, was in remarkably good uh, state. Um, uh, and uh, also uh, the gardens, uh, uh, the wall garden, uh, thanks to people like this guy in the picture, we call him John Wildlife, like we do here in Wales, uh, who has a great little love of the countryside, um, uh, was able to produce the fantastic fruits uh, and fantastic output uh, from the gardens. And then in 2006, we built a Green Oak Concert Hall, uh, which today is quite a major arts venue uh, in West Wales. And, um, and by the way, when you finish... Uh, on Sunday, uh, we actually have uh, a book festival uh, of some 30 to 40 uh, writers from Wales and beyond. So if you haven't drunk enough and you're not too tired, come along to the, to the book festival at Rossigill, which is up the, up the road about five or ten minutes away. Uh, here's a view from my uh, bedroom window taken this summer. And Asa was talking about his school. Um, <clears throat> uh, I went to uh, a school in the middle of a slum in the outskirts of Calcutta. We had open drains on either side. And we used to walk along holding our noses. <clears throat> so when I see something like this out of my bedroom window, <clears throat> I, I, I have to pinch myself to say, is this real? Because it's a privilege. And uh, I think privileges uh, come with uh, responsibilities. 
So <clears throat> to protect the environment that we are in, um, Ross Gilman is today in, in sort of three pillars. Um, the Pembrokeshire Retreat, um, which um, carries out and administers uh, the, uh, the work uh, of, the, of, the, of the gardens, the house, and actually employs the staff. Uh, there's a charity called uh, Mentir Rosa Gillen, be set up earlier this year, uh, and its objects are to promote the arts uh, in this part of uh, rural Wales with the view of uh, um, acting as an engine for rural regeneration, very much like they do here at Forest. Uh, and we've been quite successful in being able to attract people there um, over the last few years. But the object of my talk is to actually talk about the third leg of this, uh, which is a, a company called Western Solar, which we set up earlier this year, with the object of using the solar business to, in, uh, to, to in a way, protect the future sustainable existence of, of Rossi uh, And I'm going to say a few words about, first about solar, about the sun. Um, some of it might be quite obvious to the people here in this audience. Um, but uh, about 80,000 terawatts of energy falls on this Earth's surface uh, every day. And it's 6,000 times the amount of energy that we actually use as humankind. Um, so it is mind-bogglingly obvious that the greatest source of energy we actually have on on this planet is the sun. And yet, and yet, we've been just completely blindsided, blindsided by the fossil, the, the fossil uh, fuel of myopia of energy companies. And I'm, I've advised and worked in the industry for 30 years or more, and I can sort of understand in some ways uh, the power that is there in a cubic foot of gas uh, or a barrel of oil. But the energy companies have not really helped in terms of putting any investment in R&D uh, into trying to discover what the next frontier for uh, renewables might be. Uh, and that's where I think the power of the future lies, and I'll come back to that in terms of the potential uh, big do that you and I have, uh, have, have as responsibility ourselves. For me, the realization came uh, when um, uh, last year um, two things happened. Um, the first was I noticed that the falling cost of PV, of photovoltaics, had been quite dramatic. In the last five years, the cost of, of photovoltaics fell by an order of magnitude, helped by countries like Germany, by countries like Spain, and now like countries like China, who started to create scale and creating a large market to bring down the cost per unit. It, it's almost like computer chips in the early days, hugely expensive. And as we created a market, we created innovation, and the cost of computing and the cost of computer chips came down. Well, PV has just started to, do, to actually do that. So, that was the first part of the phenomenon. But the second was this thing called the feed-in tariff. People refer to it as a FIT. And the FIT has two components to it. The first component is, for the first time, energy companies are obliged to buy energy from uh, renewable sources from the likes of you and me. Up till last year, they were not obliged to. And the second part of the FIT was that the government offered a favorable tariff. So if you produce clean energy, uh, you were given a favorable tariff to improve the rate of return. So these two things together then appear to be the perfect admixture for us to engage in as big a project as we could possibly afford at Rosa Gilwan. And these were the three things that we seemed to need. We needed south-facing land, a few acres, in this case about seven acres of south-facing land, which we, which we had. Uh, we needed an 11 kVA line, <clears throat> a three-phase 11 kVA line, to take the substantial amount of energy away, which we put in when we uh, built the concert hall. 
And the third thing we needed was a finance. And for the finance, our plan was to go to the banks and raise finance from the banks. But then something not very nice happened. Uh, this is our Minister for Energy. I call him my bogeyman. Because the scheme was so successful, so many people decided to go and do this, that early this year he announced that they were going to can the scheme. They're going to slash the tariff by 70% from the 1st of August of this year. Um, and 95% of people that were planning to do the scheme uh, abandoned it. Uh, because there was no way they were going to be able to get it uh, done in time. So we had to, tr to think quite long and hard as to whether this was something that we wanted to risk and wanted to do. Um, uh, and that's where thinking really about the, the real reason why we were actually doing the project became quite useful. So the financial return was important, um, but all the other things were important too. Uh, releasing a thousand tons of carbon now very very small compared to the billions and billions of tons that we release into the atmosphere every year but nevertheless important in the in the small the community we lived in uh, lowering our operating costs I, I talked to energy economists that said in 10 to 15 years we could we could not afford to run a project like a Rosa Gilwin on the base of fossil fuels it would become uneconomic to do so so this therefore now became an imperative for sustainability. And it's actually on that basis that we decided to press the button and actually continue. Um, I raided my pension fund, cashed in every share I had, and I'm, th and I'm really glad I did it. Um, um, and we decided to actually continue. Uh, we, we, we went for planning approval. We engaged engineers to do planning. And you'll see there on the right-hand side, what the solar farm actually looks like. Uh, it looks a bit like a lake. It was quite well concealed. Uh, some people said it looked like a field of potatoes with polythene over it. Um, and uh, the other thing that we also did is we guaranteed that the site would be 100% recyclable at the end of its life. The design life for this is about 40 years. Um, it, could go on, it could go on forever. So there is not a scrap of concrete anywhere on the site. Um, uh, all, the, all the frames are actually held down with those things on the right ground screws. But, the, but now the biggest challenge was trying to find a contractor who would take on a personal guarantee from me to actually do the work and also find a, uh, a final contractor that was able to do the work within the time scale. And that's when I discovered a guy called Miroslav. And Miroslav was an ex-Cold War Czech engineer who had a factory, he had an engineering firm in the Czech uh, Republic. And it just so happened that Miroslav and I shared the same sense of values. Um, and that also is, has been a great learning for us, finding people who you deal with who share the same sense of values. And we signed... I'm sorry, we didn't sign. We just shook on a contract for a multi-million construction of a solar farm on the basis of total trust and a sense of shared of values. I was very pleased I found Miroslav. Um, so we had planning permission. We had our grid reinforcement. We had our commercial construction agreement. And we were all ready to go by the end of May. Um, we asked that 20% of the content should be sourced from Wales. So the civil engineering work, the commissioning uh, came from Wales. The photovoltaic panels, by the way, we sourced from California uh, because what we wanted to do is we wanted to have the latest technology, thin film technology from a company called Mio Soleil in California. So it's quite a, quite a multinational effort, uh, all centered around Rosa Gilwin. Uh, and then... There was a race to complete. Uh, the work started uh, two and a half thousand, sorry, two and a half, kilo, two and a half kilometers of cable, 800 meters of trenching, and watching these teams come together and work was like poetry in action. Uh, to see 10,000 solar panels go up in just over six, six weeks, nearly seven weeks, 
uh, was, was frankly impressive. Um, and, then, and then to the last day, um, when we had sign-off, uh, and I was like one of Caroline's expectant fathers, waiting, uh, you know, pacing around uh, the acceptance area. The acceptance was done by the grid. Uh, and what I was really waiting for was for the sign-off. And that was it. We were connected to the grid. Uh, and that was a hugely, hugely happy day of my, of my life in the last, in the last year. So, um, I stood out in the field uh, yesterday with the sun shining down, uh, thinking, uh, what should I pose as my big do to the, get to the people uh, here today? Um, and um, if I have a big do, it would be, we've really got to work to convince our political leaders, our political representatives, the people that represent us, because we, I think we do still live in a, in a democracy, uh, we have to convince them to think of the long term. We have to convince companies to think of the long term, um, because it's short-termism that's actually driven us into this myopic, fossil-based world of deep-sea drilling, Arctic exploration, ripping up half of Canada. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to convince our politicians, we've got to convince our companies that they've got to think of the, of the long term, because it's a long term that will stimulate scale, stimulate R&D, and stimulate uh, a world where renewables will then actually start to make a lot more sense. To me, standing in that field, really, uh, was like, it's almost like planting trees. When you plant trees, you don't see those trees come to fruition until you've passed on, but it's your future generations that do. And that's the sense of long term that we need to, uh, that we need to get as far as our political leadership are concerned. So, so that's the big do. The small do is if you're doing a project that's really close to your heart, it's really important for you, choose people to do it with and that share the same sense of values as yourself. Thank you.